or evening, everyone, depending on where you are dialed in from. This is Doug Stevenson with WSP. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a second webinar in an asset management series, and today's topic is specifically on reducing operating expenses through maintenance optimization. There is a bit of a transit flavor on this presentation, but we do believe the principles are applicable to a wide variety of industries. Um, as we go through this presentation, if you have questions, please put those in the chat box. We will have time for questions at the end. Uh, a little bit about me, I have about 32 years experience with engineering maintenance uh, practices. Uh, specifically, the last 12 years, I've been focusing in the transit industry. Uh, mechanical engineer uh, trained with an MBA and spent about 10 years of my career as a mechanic. Today's agenda, so first we will very briefly talk about the challenges that are facing our, our industry, specifically around operating expenses, and then present some simple, straightforward techniques to try to close that gap operating expense budgetary gap through some maintenance optimization technologies or, or uh, methodologies, and then we'll provide some examples. Before we get into the details of it, I just want to introduce you to WSP. Um, WSP has established a global community of asset management consultants. Uh, we provide asset management strategy and input into standards on a local, national, uh, as well as global basis. And we also maintain assets and asset information on our client's behalf. So getting into the challenges that we are facing uh, with our operating expenses. Uh, when the pandemic hit, Transit and transportation arguably uh, was one of the hardest hit industries. Uh, and they're forecasting that trend to occur at least through the end of the next fiscal year. Uh, but there's also concern uh, that we may never reach the pre-pandemic ridership. Uh, right now, employers and employees are finding um, alternatives to coming into the office, and we believe there is a potential that there's gonna be a portion of folks that just stay at home, right? So what that means is, from a transit perspective, and, and likely many industries, we're gonna to have to get lean, and we're gonna to have to get efficient in how we are managing our assets. So where does that opportunity lie within the operating budget? Uh, traditionally, when transits are faced with uh, budgetary challenges, the way that they attack it is through operations. And so normally they will reduce services uh, and then the labor that is related to those services, the operators of those services, whether they're bus drivers, uh, station managers, et cetera, the fuel consumed, and then maintenance gets pulled along with that. Uh, but normally they don't attack the wedge that is specific to maintenance and optimizing maintenance. And so that's what we wanna focus on right now. We believe there's opportunity there and we wanna talk about some common sense ways to achieve that near term. So in a perfect world, our transit properties have already adopted some of the more progressive maintenance approaches. They're doing predictive maintenance. Uh, they're leveraging smart assets to tell us when they need to be maintained or replaced. Uh, they've built their maintenance regime up from a reliability-centered maintenance approach. Uh, and then they're continuously improving uh, their maintenance processes and procedures by gaining data from their assets in their, their maintenance organizations and refining it as they go. Um, but we do know we are not in a perfect world from a transit perspective, and there are a lot of good reasons for that. Um, first of all, transit, most transit properties have been around for decades, and they didn't have the advantage of these 
uh, technologies and methodologies being around when they develop their maintenance approaches. Uh, secondly, they've mostly adopted their maintenance approaches from vendor recommendations and vendors traditionally are going to recommend some very um, uh, conservative approaches on maintenance and, and finally we're busy running railroads literally right and we really just don't have time to do a complete overhaul of our maintenance regimes so I, I want to put a caveat in and saying um, all of those techniques are valid and every transit property should be engaging in those and putting those in but the reality is most don't have maintenance programs that are based on those techniques right now and so we need something that we can implement short term to take care of this budgetary gap as best we can so we need to deal with reality on reality's terms right and deal with the scenario that we find ourselves in within WSP we have developed a methodology for doing just that we call it asset management maintenance optimization and it's basically a approach to using some common sense uh, techniques to reduce our maintenance operating expense portion uh, that AM 2O process uh, very simply uh, we start out with collecting our data uh, on our assets then we take our um, inventory of assets and we prioritize which assets to take a look at first based on some basic metrics then we look at those assets asset category by asset category for appropriateness for some optimization techniques then we prioritize those optimization techniques and then we implement those one by one and then we measure and control right and so we'll talk about each one of these um, portions of the process individually the first data collection um, our number one source for data is going to be our computer maintenance management systems or our enterprise asset management systems they house our asset inventories and all the maintenance plan and historical maintenance data that's going to be our number one source um, the type of data that we want to be getting out of those simply we want to have an inventory of our assets that are categorized we want to know if we can what the condition of those assets are and any pertinent life cycle data like purchase date when they were overhauled etc um, and then we want to get our maintenance data out of it uh, not only our maintenance plan but the historical performance of that maintenance plan specifically the labor in materials and how often we've done that and when we've done it same thing on the corrective maintenance side we want to know what failures are occurring how often and then how much time uh, and money we are spending to correct them the next thing we want to do is we want to prioritize our assets once we've pulled that data um, three factors that we want to prioritize our assets on uh, total cost to maintain our PM to CM ratio, and then agility to optimize. Agility to optimize is a metric that's a little bit um, subjective. It's really kind of looking at, you know, for that particular asset category or department that manages it, uh, what is their flexibility to change their maintenance regime, right, and adopt changes? Are there te technology barriers? Is there some sort of a regulatory barrier? or is there a workforce barrier that prevents them from changing? We wanna put these three uh, metrics together when we decide which assets to go after if we are going to look at our entire organization's asset inventory. So if we take our entire inventory of assets and we look at those in a prioritized way, uh, there's a few things that we wanna look at um, when we put those together right on a total cost to maintain perspective here we're looking at 20 asset categories from a plant department um, and the first thing that we want to look at here when we analyze this is we want to look at those asset classes that are basically taking up the majority of the cost to maintain right um, because of the scale 
if you are able to achieve an efficiency there, it's likely going to be a larger efficiency, a more impactful one. So we want to look at those asset categories first. The second thing that we want to focus on is asset categories that have a high PM to CM ratio. Uh, these are arguably the easier um, ratios to fix, right? It's easier to cut back on a planned maintenance program that we know is resulting in very few failures as opposed to the third scenario where we have a very high CM to PM ratio, right? We want to look at those last because those are generally harder to fix. It generally gets into um, a redesign of the component, uh, a replacement of the component, longer lead time things, right? And so that's kind of the way that you want to look at these in a prior priority, right? Um, so once we've prioritized our assets, uh, we want to do what we call optimization evaluation and that's to look at each asset category uh, for a potential for different optimization strategies uh, the first optimization strategy that we like to look at and all of these i think are very common sense right uh, is a frequency optimization this is quite simply looking at that um, asset category and looking at its planned maintenance and determining whether we can change the frequency that it occurs go from you know, 6,000 miles to 8,000 miles in between inspections or 30 days to 45 days. Uh, the next optimization strategy we want to look at is maintenance instruction optimization. And this is quite simply looking at the actual maintenance that is being performed and making sure that it's all valid, efficient, streamlined um, for the particular maintenance activity. The third one is performance optimization. And this is really looking at the mechanic population and how they are performing this work and determining whether they are performing the work efficiently and whether you can set a standard and train mechanics to get that work done in a more efficient manner. Uh, the fourth is life cycle optimization. And this is looking at an asset class to see whether there is an engineering modification that would reduce the total cost to maintain, whether that asset class should be replaced, et cetera, that sort of thing. And finally, maintenance maturity optimization. This is kind of going back to a previous slide, looking at other ways that we can maintain this asset, whether it's through a predictive model, a condition-based model, um, looking at that asset category as a candidate for changing to a reliability centered maintenance program um, the one thing that i really want to stress here is one uh maintenance strategy that a lot of times gets forgotten but is very valid is basically run to failure right and that's really where we want to look are we maintaining things that really don't have a safety or operational impact that we could let run to failure So looking at examples of some of these optimization opportunities, uh, this example is for rail car maintenance. Um, basically, their standard rail car maintenance for a particular client. They're performing it on a monthly basis, and we wanted to look at moving it to a um, mileage or usage-based maintenance. So the important things to look at when we do this, um, so we wanna know, first of all, okay, right now, when you are performing it on a monthly basis, what is the distribution of mileage uh, that occurs in between the performance of these uh, PMs? What we found was a, a fairly significant distribution, right, with the mean being around 6,000 miles, right? And so you have a whole population of assets that is being maintained well before 6,000 miles, right? Assets that are arguably being over-maintained, right? So we wanna to move to a mileage basis so that we kind of chop out that first half of that histogram uh, from being maintained early. The second thing we wanna do is we wanna do some validation to see if there's any correlation between the mileage that we are seeing and failure modes, right? And pretty much, try to rule it out as a driver for failures. And there's some analytic techniques you can use, Cox regressions, Weibull distributions, Kaplan-Meier, 
um, distributions to make those sort of determinations. Most reliability centered engineers understand the fact that at least within the realms that, at least in transit, uh, we are maintaining our assets. There's little correlation between mileage and the failures that we occur. Uh, the failures tend to be fairly random. And so what we wanna push for is taking advantage of that opportunity. Um, in this scenario, we set a reasonable target for performing that mileage at the 75th percentile. Um, what that ended up doing was dramatically reducing how often we were maintaining the, the rail cars from an annual basis in labor and material. It netted out about a 2.2 million uh, savings. The other added benefit out of that approach on a daily basis out of that fleet of rail cars, there was about four additional rail cars available for service each day, right? So um, effective technique to think about here, right, is changing um, your um, maturity that you are maintaining your assets by. If you're doing it by time, think about going to usage. If you're doing usage, is there a condition methodology you can use, etc. cetera. <clears throat> uh, next optimization evaluation opportunity example here is for a frequency optimization, basically going from a 30-day PM cycle to 45 days. Uh, for this particular client, we looked at two asset categories, uh, those being tunnel ventilation fans and escalators. Uh, we did analytics to validate we wouldn't expect any additional defects to occur um, by changing that frequency from a 30-day cycle to a 45-day cycle. In each scenario, there was some fairly significant savings, um, around 5,000 hours for the tunnel ventilation fans and around 26,000 hours uh, for escalator maintenance. And this is on an annual basis. So very significant savings, from just moving that cycle. Now you have to do the analytics and you have to pilot this to validate um, that you're not introducing failures along the way here, um, but very, very valuable technique. Uh, final two examples here, we have performance and maintenance instruction optimizations. Uh, the top graphic here, um, we are looking at a uh, performance optimization. <clears throat> so what we did was we mapped out the distribution of hours that it takes to perform a routine maintenance. Um, found the mean was about nine hours and standard deviation, you know, on either side around three hours, right? And so we thought there was great opportunity there. It seemed like a large portion of the mechanics were able to do it in 6.2 hours or less. And so we wanted to go in and, and audit and then provide some training and set a standard for performance of this PM. Um, what we're ending up with in the pilot mode here is we've got our mechanics down to about a five hour on average performance of this same PM here. Um, when we roll this out to all divisions for this client, uh, if we're able to maintain that five hours on average, it ends up being around a 13,000 hour savings annually. Uh, the bottom example here is quite simply looking at the actual maintenance uh, that was being performed. So this maintenance is performed um, with hundreds and hundreds of separate inspection points. And this graphic on the bottom is representing one of those sections of that maintenance that is performed. So what we wanted to do is look and see how many times the mechanic was having to actually take an action at each one of these inspection points. Um, we looked at around 400 performances of this maintenance in this area here. What we're interested in is every time we see a zero, that zero indicates that no action was taken no defect was found 400 times looking at these um, particular items. Um, and so the next step here is to now look at these steps to see if they are suitable for removal. 
ensuring they're not a safety or performance related thing and really streamline this maintenance and get this down to even less than five hours if we can. Um, the next step in the process, obviously you wanna prioritize. Now, if you're a single asset class uh, owner, um, you really don't need to prioritize your asset categories or your optimization techniques. You're gonna know which one you want to implement. But if you're doing this for an entire organization with a diverse set of assets, you wanna have a prioritization optimization uh, a prioritization strategy. And so you wanna set yourself weighted criteria and rate each one of your opportunities on it. This is an example that we used for a client uh, with the different weighting factors. And anybody that is interested in doing this, we would be happy to share it, right? But it's, again, just a way to prioritize what you attack first. So the final stages, um, implement, measure, and control. Um, just like any project, uh, we want to pilot this. When we do our pilot, we want to select a representative um, size and type of assets, right? If there's anomalies between this class of assets, we want to make sure they're represented, represented in the pilot, and we want to make sure it's a statistically significant uh, size of the population. We want to have a rollback plan, and we want to establish metrics to validate that we're achieving what we wanted. Um, once you've piloted and validated that you've received the results you want, then you roll this out for the entire population uh, and then maintain those metrics going forward, at least for you know uh, what you deem to be an appropriate amount of time to ensure that you don't need to roll this back in the future. Um, So with that said, I'd like to basically turn it over to questions. If there's any questions that folks have on our um, proposed methodologies for trying to get some um, savings out of the operating budget. Okay, I do see our first question here um, from Israel Nava Garcia out of the US, how are savings converted to actual budgetary savings? Assuming staff would need to be reduced, majority of staff are full time. Um, it's a very good question and something that we certainly face, right? So that operating expense, um, it is largely composed of labor, right? Um, materials does play a portion of that, uh, but the biggest portion of that is labor. And when we're talking about reducing labor hours, you really don't save anything until you either reduce overtime or headcount. And so what we have found is the best way to go about this is first look at overtime, right? And whatever overtime is being performed, move that into your normal day as you create efficiencies. The second thing is, you know, most organizations have a large backlog of open positions, certainly is the case in transit. Um, so try to take that staff uh, where you are creating efficiencies and move them into those other areas of need, right? And close positions that way. Uh, the third area that we think is important to take advantage of is just through natural attrition. Um, natural attrition in transit is around 10 to 14 percent on an annual basis. Um, that's occurring all the way from the mechanic level all the way up to the top levels. And so there's plenty of opportunity there to account for those efficiencies by not backfilling some of the areas that are closing. Um, thank you for the question. Um, next question here from uh, apologies if. Um, I mispronounce your name, say we Chu from Malaysia. Uh, discuss latest on integration of technology and asset management. Um, okay, so within the industry, uh, there has been a lot of integration of technologies in asset management in commercial sectors, particularly in manufacturing, right? Um, 
they're very much more focused on bottom lines and, and margins. And so have been a lot more flexible. Um, they're also dealing with much larger quantities of assets. And so, you know, a long time ago, they have moved to smart assets, connected assets uh, with sophisticated PLCs and integrated those to their EAM solutions to allow them to take advantage of predictive technologies or, or methodologies, allowing those assets to tell us when they need media changed out or when there's metrics that are out of sync that require repair. Um, in transit, we are lagging for sure. Um, the assets certainly are coming with smart capabilities with the ability to do self-monitoring with onboard monitoring solutions and the ability to integrate um, many you know almost all being produced today are um, coming with the ability to integrate through wi-fi um, i will say on the transit side um, they've been slow to pick that technology up right but i i do know there's a lot of interest in doing that in the industry um thank you for the question um the next one i see is from krish natasan from india uh, the question is how do you think the budget loss for transportation industry will impact the maintenance costs and efficiency thereof um so again a good question um Operating budgets will be diminished, um, and so your maintenance budgets are going to have to follow for sure. Um, the managers of these transit properties are going to be forced to make some hard budget decisions, and they're likely going to um, put those metrics on their departmental leads. Um, so there's going to be a demand for maintenance budgets to be reduced. And so it's going to be extremely important for maintenance departments to have logical strategies for how they're gonna achieve those. Um, thank you for the question. Um, next one I see here is from Andy Bartlett from New Zealand. Andy asks, where can the most value be gained rolling out quick wins or implementing tactical management of big spends? Um, okay, so I I have a bit of a cop-out answer, I think, for you, Andy. I think the answer is you need to do both. Um, I think the budget crunches are real time and you need to take quick win actions immediately to address those. Um, so hence the techniques that we're presenting today, right? Um, long term, um, I think it is important that all industries are focusing in more mature, progressive maintenance programs, taking advantage of all the data that we were able to capture today with our smart assets, developing predictive maintenance programs, um, allowing our assets to tell us when they need to be maintained, uh, developing our planned maintenance regime from a reliability-centered maintenance approach. Uh, those things obviously are much harder to implement, but those are, are frankly going to give you uh, much bigger returns. Um, so I think you got to do both, Andy, um, particularly in the short term. I, I think everybody is facing near-term budget crises. So I think you got to do the quick wins now. Uh, but in the same time, I think if you haven't already started, you need to be investing in those um, more impactful um, strategies. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, looking at some of the other questions we have, Question, does moving to a mileage slash usage maintenance cycle instead of schedule increase complexity for planning maintenance? For example, when to withdraw vehicles from service for maintenance check? Um, that's a good question. Obviously, 
um, when you are maintaining based on a calendar, um, it's very well known. You can predict out into the future, you know, conceivably years, every time you're going to need to bring that asset in. And so it does allow you to um, schedule easier. Uh, the reality is our assets do not wear based on the cycles of the moons and tides, right? And so we're, we're basically setting ourselves up for inefficiencies by maintaining on a time-based cycle. Um, there are ways that you can minimize um, the planning and logistics uncertainty that is introduced by moving to a mileage basis, right? Um, you can track your mileage and put a uh, alert uh, with a margin well enough into the um, um, before that metric is achieved so that you can plan, right? I do believe there's ways to do this. Um, I have seen it done. Um, and frankly, most transit organizations that are running rail are running um, buses. Um, the bus side has certainly embraced mileage-based uh, maintenance. Um, so I think it's doable. I think it's something that's within the capabilities of just about every organization out there. Um, another question here, how does this technique take into consideration organizational change management, competency, and buy-in issues, which are typical to transit in North America? Um, this is a, a very excellent question, and I will say we spend the majority of our time, quite frankly, doing organizational change management. Um, and so be prepared for that, right? Um, transit organizations have been doing maintenance in the same fashion for decades. And so there will be a large component of organizational change management required as you make this change. Um, and so you just gotta be prepared for it and you need to include um, participation across the board, um, all the way from mechanics to supervisors to management, labor relations, and uh, union representative as well. And we've included those and it's made it a lot easier to um, conduct these kind of changes when you do include labor and union representatives because you know, at the end of the day, we are dealing with a challenge that I think everybody understands, right? And if everybody is involved in that solution, um, there's a higher potential of acceptance rate. Um, I think that is it for questions. Um, again, if you have any questions, I would love to hear from folks about um, some of the techniques that they are currently deploying in order to manage their budgets from a maintenance perspective. My contact information is up there on the screen. I would love to hear from you. Feel free to shoot me um, questions if you wanna hear about um, our experiences offline. Um, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much.